I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker for tonight. As usual, I want you always to want to remind you to turn off your cell phones if you have forgotten that. Another thing that I wanted to mention, partly because a couple of people asked me last night as they, uh, last week as they were leaving, uh, whether these lectures are going to, are being taped and whether they're available anyplace else. And they will be available on MCAT. By the end of the series, we'll be able to give the, give you the exact schedule for that. And if you don't get MCAT, I think they'll also be online later on in the spring. So we will give you a link for the online um, access later on in the series. Series, and then we'll also let you know the, uh, the schedule for MCAT. Okay, good. Hooray, you made it. Go Grizz and all that, yes. So I have a chance to introduce tonight uh, Professor Rebecca Bendick. Uh, Professor Bendick is an associate professor in the Geosciences Department here at the university, and she joined us in 2006. Uh, you can read in your program about her research, which takes her all around the world and has her dealing with all kinds of high-tech um, uh, simulations and so on and so forth. Um, I have asked each of the lecturers to tell me uh, something about themselves. Thank God Rebecca did not also share this with everybody in the program as Dane did last time, so that was kind of embarrassing. Um, what, Re what Rebecca tells me is that she's really sort of the, uh, the exception, being a scientist in a whole family filled with artists, writers, painters, poets, and so on and so forth. So I'll bet that the uh, conversations around your kitchen table or around your family reunions can be pretty interesting. And she says that she's accustomed because of this to listen to scientific and other questions being talked about from many, many different points of view. And I'm really excited to hear Rebecca this evening. Um, I also asked each of the lecturers to tell me how he or she became involved in social justice issues, because uh, everybody comes from such a different field. Uh, and it may be a little bit difficult to tell how a geoscientist becomes involved with social justice issues. And Rebecca told me that uh, she became in uh, involved in this kind of um, concern about what's fair and what isn't fair when she was involved in some uh, rapid um, rapid response after various earthquakes uh, in various parts of the world where one quickly finds out whose resources are where and how quickly one gets resources and or how slowly. Um, and so um, it's kind of interesting for us to have her here to talk not about only about geoscience but to talk about how um, information technology is a matter of justice and is a matter of fairness in our world today. So Rebecca with no further Further ado. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me here to, to speak to you. It's, it's always a great pleasure and a great honor not only to represent my colleagues on the current faculty of the University of Montana, but to talk to an audience that's here because they're interested and, and because they're care because they care and not because their mom made them. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. Um, I do admit, I think, first all, first off, that uh, I'm a little uncomfortable with this topic. It's a little bit of a stretch for me because, as Linda said, uh, I am a geoscientist by training. So my field of expertise is in the physics of the Earth. And if you want to talk about that, piece of cake. <laughs> I won't really get the quivers. But talking about social justice is, is a, a couple of steps away from my area of expertise. And so what I'm going to do today is talk to you sort of from the heart about some of these ideas that I've had. And, and I'm going to pretend to know 
depth of scholarly knowledge about the literature and the philosophy of, of social justice. Fortunately for me, Dane Scott gave you a, a sort of preface of that and, and set, I think, the idea of social justice within the context of ethics in general. And I'd like to take that as a stepping off point for this talk. But my ultimate goal in, in working with you guys tonight is for us to act like a tiny community of our own and see if we amongst ourselves can, can actually develop a law that tells us what the relationship between information and social justice either is or should be. So I'm going to ask you um, pretty often to give me ideas and interact with me as we puzzle through these things. And the one thing I do know about philosophy and social justice and matters of the humanities is the place you always have to start is by clearly defining what it is that you're actually talking about. Otherwise, you get into big trouble. So what I'd like to do to start is to just tell you where I'm coming from with the critical words in this title and the, what kind of a rule I want you guys to be able to develop. So I'm looking for something that tells us about the relationship between information and social justice. So what is information? To me, information means an interpretation of real data about the physical world that we live in. I frankly have a strong preference for interpretations and physical data that arise from the use of the scientific method. But you'll see later in my talk that information is not in this context anyway, is not necessarily restricted to scientific information. But to me, information is knowledge that most people would agree upon because it arises out of some methodological system for developing both data and interpretations about the world that we live in. Social justice is a trickier one. So to me, the definition of social justice arises out of Again, the two words that create that term. What is a society, first of all? To me, a society is a collection of individuals who have voluntarily decided to come together because in doing so, it, their well-being is improved. So the purpose of a society is for individuals to act in concert to create a higher state of well-being, to improve their, the condition of their life by acting in concert. And this strikes me as having to be true in an evolutionary sense, because if it weren't an advantage for human individuals to come together to form societies, if it didn't confer some greater fitness and greater welfare upon us, then we wouldn't do it. We'd each act as single individuals, and we would have done so over our evolutionary history and for all time. To me, another important element of social justice is the justice element. And to me, that means non-coercive. So we come together as a society to improve our well-being, but we do so voluntarily. So suppose we had a society in which everyone woke up each morning and you got a printout from a computer in your wall that said, today you must do this, this, and this. And if you do this, this, and this, your ultimate welfare over the long term of your life will be optimized. It will be the highest possible welfare. Well, to me, that may be an optimized society in terms of welfare, but it's not a just one because that requirement toward bettering my state of being is, is coercive. It's required. And so to me, social justice encompasses this idea that we work together as a society because it's better for all of us in some grand way, maybe not every single day when I'm mad about the traffic, but in some grand and global way over the course of our lifetime. It's better for us to cooperate than not. And in cooperating, we choose to do so voluntarily. We're not forced to, to do so. So somehow what I want to explore here is what is the role of objective information in a society where people are trying to cooperate to maximize their well-being in a non-coercive way. Okay, 
Does anybody hate that definition? <laughs> Great, because now I'm going to step onto much more comfortable ground for me. And that is, physics and philosophy share a tremendous number of tools. Actually, it's, it's pretty reasonable that they do that because they have the same origins in, in human creativity and thought. And one of the most basic tools, both in physics and in philosophy, is something called a thought experiment, which is when you're confronted with a problem that seems so complex as to be intractable, the best place to start is to reduce that problem, to simplify it to an extreme case that's much easier to figure out, and then build back all, bolt on all the complexities as you go, but ha with a firm foundation. And Dane did that for you guys last week by giving you the trolley problem, right? This is a classic philosophic trope that's so simple as to be ridiculous, but it helps us to illuminate what are our working rules and parameters that we use to make decisions about fairness. So let's do the same thing um, with the idea about information and social justice. Actually, I just yeah skipped a slide. What I was going to say is, for example, this is a Buzkashi game. This is a game um, in Afghanistan and, and the mountains of Pakistan where you basically play polo with a goat's head. And it's incredibly violent and chaotic. But these people have chosen to get together non-coercively and play a game that has a set of rules that require that they cooperate. And if they follow the rules, even though they're crazy violent and really incomprehensible to a bystander, then the game is fun. It works. The spectators have a great time. Nobody dies, or you know, only once in a while does somebody <laughs> die. And so this, to me, sort of epitomizes the notion of a just society in the sense that people have come together to further the common good for some goal. In this case, not particularly noble, but a heck of a lot of fun. Uh, and they do so in a way that promotes organization, but it also requires some amount of information flow. So let's go back to our thought experiment. I want to, as I said, explore what the role of information is in creating a just society or in creating or improving a state of social justice. So let's take the simplest possible notion of welfare or good, which is to say that it's better for the individuals in a society to be alive than dead. Now, there are probably some circumstances when this is not, in fact, the case. But let's take it as a simple truth that it's better to be alive than dead. So suppose I know that if these people don't move 10 meters to the left, they're going to be hit by an asteroid in six minutes. This is information that I have, and they do not. So we have an unequal state of information. How many people, raise your hand now, think that I have a moral obligation to tell them, hey, move. OK, essentially everyone. So we can step one step towards our law and say that in obvious circumstances like this, where a information is asymmetrical, but it's easy to convey, I'm standing right next to these guys, that I must save their lives by giving them information. Let's make it one step more complicated now. Suppose I have information now. I'm in these girls' village in Kyrgyzstan. And I know that they, when they get older, are going to die of something horrible. But it's not for a while, and I won't be there. Do I still have a moral obligation to tell their parents about this level of risk? Give me a hand. So almost nobody. Now, I'm curious, for some of you who didn't raise your hand, why do you think I don't have an obligation to intervene? Intervene to what end? Well, suppose I could tell them, OK, look, 
if you just add, if you just have these girls drink water from 200 meters higher in fact this is a great example i didn't even really think about it when i chose this picture but there's a hot spring in this village that is incredibly radioactive so if i simply told the parents in this village, they ought to p get their water from above the spring rather than below the spring. They can have a positive health outcome on these children for the rest of their lives. But they won't, you know, nobody just takes a drink from the radon spring and drops dead. It's a sort of time delayed thing. So if my intervention is simple, though it has a time lag, must I tell them? Okay, now more people are nodding. So let me see some hands. So basically everyone. So even if you have an information delay, even if there's a time lag between cause and effect, it certainly promotes the social welfare. It improves the state of social justice if I share this information in a reasonable way. Okay, so suppose the village is a big city. And I have information still about the fact that a really a lot of people in this city are going to die at some fairly close future time. Do I have an obligation to tell every person in that city that they are at gra in grave danger? Now raise your hand if you think yes. OK, so s slightly fewer. And why is that? Well, everyone's saying, how do you tell him? Because the burden on me now has increased, right? So at some point, if this is Lahore, Pakistan, that has 10 million people in it, it would take me the rest of my life to go door to door telling everybody that they are going to die in the next humongous earthquake. Now suppose I don't know for sure. And in this situation, I only know the probability that these people are going to die during their lifetime. So let's say they have a 60% chance of a devastating earthquake in the next 30 years. Is my moral obligation reduced yet again? Or should I still tell them that information? Or must I tell them that information? Who still says I must? OK. So with each addition of complexity, we're, I'm getting fewer hands. I don't know if you guys are already bored witless and you can't raise your hand because you're asleep. <laughs> or if, in fact, these complexities are helping you to refine in your mind what are the inf information requirements to ensure a just society. I'm hoping the latter. Now suppose I do provide that information, but I provide it in a form that's not easy for those people to understand. So I publish a scientific paper, for example, that says what the probability of an earthquake in the Kashmir region of Pakistan will be in the next 50 years. Or I issue bottles of poison, but the warning labels are in Tagalog, and I'm distributing them in Mississippi. So it's not easy. The warning's there now. I've s maybe satisfied my moral requirement, but the people on the other end are having a hard time using it. Is that OK? Is that sufficient? So we've refined our idea, hopefully, quite a bit. And I'm wondering if we can actually write down some rules about what kind of information transfer should be required to ensure social justice. Just based on our little thought experiment, rest assured we're going to probably revisit and revise this as we go. So anybody want to take a stab at giving me a piece of a rule? What's the kind of sim- Okay, 
So that's relevant. Okay, is that it? Must be understandable. To whom? Must be true. Okay. That's true, but we do have, thank God for me, I'm not doing an epistemology lecture tonight. <laughs> and there are some like pre existing ideas in human scholarship about what makes something true or not true. So just my opinion about, you know, if I grew a huge long gray beard and wore a robe and walked around with a the end of the world is nigh sign does not necessarily satisfy this moral requirement and we're safe there because I can't really back that up with some known standards of, of truth, right? So I'm gonna dodge that bullet slightly, by, but I also think it's not much of a dodge because I bet all of you guys have a pretty, you know, bounded sense of what in fact is, is true. And, and potentially true and relevant are, are closely tied in this context alone. Yeah, matters, right? So it's not much good for me to go around like telling everybody they're going to die if neither they nor I can do anything about it, right? No, does anybody think I would still have a moral requirement to issue that warning? I, I think that there's an argument to be made for that. But if you're going to be strictly pragmatic about it, it should be relevant. OK. Oh, that was already there. How about like the amount of investment required, either on my behalf or on the listener? Yeah. I think we have to involve other people. You can't go to every person in the board, but you can get to Awesome. Can I beg you to hold that thought until a little later on? Okay, so let's just say somebody has an obligation to share information that's relevant to people, that affects their lives, that's understandable, that's true, and anything else? Timely. I would go so far as to maybe add something about kind of what's the burden both on me and on them. So for example, like if it's going to take me the rest of my life to knock on every door in Lahore, then I can't be expected to do that. And likewise, if the response of these villagers is they have to build a three quarters of a billion dollar radiation dome over their village. Well, that's not very reasonable too, either. So can we add a piece about sort of a reasonable response? OK. Is anybody like dying to add another piece to this? OK. I promise we'll go back to it. But what I want to do now is actually go through a couple of case studies. So never mind our sort of simple-minded thought experiments. Let's actually look at some real examples where we can test this as a hypothesis. That in fact, let's, I'm going to reformulate this a little bit and say that now our working rule is that it does do good. It does improve social welfare and social justice if relevant, time, understandable, and true information is provided to people 
in such a way that they can act upon it in a reasonable fashion. And for me, the easiest way to look at this is, is where I come from in this question, which is looking at what happens in communities during great geologic catastrophes. And so the best way to do this is to look at events of comparable magnitude worldwide in places where information is provided and places where information is not provided. And we can compare the outcomes. So I'm going to do two sets of earthquakes. The first is relatively, I mean, I would call these moderate-sized earthquakes, so around magnitude 7. There are three notable ones that are around magnitude 7 that are very comparable to one another. The first is the Loma Prieta earthquake. This happened in the Santa Cruz Mountains in 1989. You'll see the magnitude here is 6.9. Don Heinemann, I'm going to play fast and loose with moment magnitude, so <laughs> don't yell at me. <laughs> the important thing is 63 deaths here. So keep that number in your mind for a minute. And 3,700 injuries. This map, it comes from the USGS earthquake pages. Those are an absolute treasure trove of information for those of you who are interested in earthquakes, earthquake science, natural catastrophes, things like that. This actually plots this scale. So this is something called instrumental intensity. It goes from one, well, really zero, all the way up to 10, and 10 is bad, and one is fine, right? One is, ooh, did I drink too much last night? And 10 is splat, <laughs> okay? So you can see that these are related very clearly to a scale of damage and also very clearly to what it feels like to be in that event. So um, intensity 10 is extreme shaking, very heavy damage. Intensity sort of five, six is you would definitely notice strong shaking and you start to see some damage around yellow. So what you can see here for California is a huge area of substantial shaking, shaking you would notice, and the potential for damage. And in fact, this, these red and orange zones are in shaking intensities that you would expect there to be buildings falling down, things breaking, people falling over, major problems. And in fact, this is true for the Loma Prieta event. So here's a picture from San Francisco in the Marina District. Probably most of you, I don't think, I have to be careful in my classes because they're actually students who were born after this. <laughs> but probably none of you fit into that category. And so you most likely remember the Bay Bridge collapse. So there was damage in this event. This is a relatively large, moderate to large earthquake. Um, but 63 deaths, right? The thing I remember is the, it happened right when the, one of the World Series games was about to start. So they had to evacuate the stadium. And it was one of the few earthquakes that actually have, has tons of live camera footage before the video phone days because all the cameras were rolling for the game. So how come only 63 deaths? Or how do we calibrate that 63 deaths in the context of our information exchange idea? Well, California has amazing preparedness. So there's a tremendous amount of resources, both scientific and outreach, devoted in the California region to informing citizens that earthquakes happen there, in getting them to be ready for them, in engaging local and state and federal government in emergency preparedness. There's earthquake zoning. You can see, uh, if I scroll down here, so they have an extensive seismic hazard zonation program that actually goes city block to city block indicating what the likely magnitude of shaking is for every single constructed thing in California. There's probabilistic earthquake maps, what's the likelihood of an event of a certain size in a certain time interval. 
There is an ongoing monitoring network so that when an earthquake happens, pagers go off all over the world. Emergency response teams know exactly what to do. They know where the event happened. And there's a whole bunch of new programs, including something called the Great California Shakeout, where everybody from toddlers to ambulance drivers to the governor all participate in a massive earthquake simulation every single year. So there's a huge pipeline. I mean, not even a pipeline. It's like, oh, I better, I shouldn't say this, but a tsunami of information that comes at the citizens of California that tell them that they are at risk and what they can do about it in a timely fashion, just like we wanted for our rule. And as a result, when there's a big earthquake, not a ton of people die. Let's compare and contrast now. The Kashmir earthquake, quite a bit bigger, honestly, 7.6, but in a much less densely populated part of the world. So you would maybe expect some economies there in, in fatalities, but look at the number of deaths, 86,000. So that's a factor of 1,000 more deaths in this event than in the Loma Prieta event. 100,000 injuries. You can tell something from the roundness of these numbers. Actually, we have no clue because in many cases, whole villages were destroyed, so there was no one left to say, this is how many people used to live here. So we really don't have a very good sense at all of how many people died in this event. Here's the same intensity shaking map. So you can see you know, a sort of comparable area, maybe those of you with who aren't like amazing geographers might not realize. It's quite about the same area of sort of magnitude or intensity six and up for shaking. So we're looking at like a comparable amount of destruction provided by the earthquake. But this is what Kashmir looked like after the event. So not a few buildings down everything down. And not a clear and concise emergency response, but please help us international nonprofits. Thank you for coming, even though it took you a month to get here. So the flow of information here is, well, the level of preparedness is poor. And we spent months in this area living and talking to the people who live here. And not one single, single person out of the thousands of people that we talked to said they had any idea that this was a seismically prone region. So somewhere, the flow of information was completely shut off. There was no incentive to prepare for this earthquake because there was no understanding on the ground that it was going to happen. And this is not to say that we didn't know the truth of this matter. So we can't avoid our responsibility for social justice here by saying, no, no, we didn't know. Because there's probably a thousand papers about earthquake hazard in the Pakistan Himalaya. Scholarly works that clearly delineate where the dangerous faults are and what the probability of their slip are. So somewhere in between the scientists and these people, all of the information was shut off and the consequences, a thousand-fold increase in death. And if we're using fatality as a proxy for social justice by saying like the worst, most unjust situation is where lots of people die that didn't have to, well, this is a very unjust situation. And it's clearly because of the information transfer. Well, let's look somewhere even worse. This earthquake is pretty much exactly the same size as the Loma Prieta event. 316,000 deaths, again, a very round number. It's not entirely clear. That could be sort of plus or minus 25 or 30 percent. 300,000 injuries, unknown property damage. If you look at the intensity of shaking here, this is actually a smaller area of intensity six and higher shaking, but it's very densely populated country. So again, you get this kind of nasty trade-off. 
And this is what Haiti looked like a couple of days after this event. Complete and utter bedlam. Really no structures intact whatsoever. This is, I think, I want to say eight or nine days after the event. There's really no sign of earth moving equipment, searchers, emergency response of any kind. None of these people have a place even to sleep that night. It's a complete mess. I mean, there's really nothing good happening here. And again, none of these people, none of the individuals who lived in this area knew that they were at grave danger for seismic hazard. But the scientific community was pretty clear. In fact, this is a repeat of an earthquake that happened 200 years ago or so. So again, there's a major break in this information pipeline that would have, could have, and should have prevented these deaths. Each of these earthquakes should have had 63 deaths, right? 50, 100 maybe, if information were given in a timely fashion. And in Haiti, it may be arguable whether or not there was any capacity to prepare for those events. But it could have been better than this, for sure. Well, let's I want to take it up a notch to the real big whammies that have just happened um, in the past couple of years and compare the Japan earthquake with the Sumatra earthquake because they tell the same exact story. So Tohoku Oki, this is a magnitude 9 earthquake. From magnitude 7 to magnitude 9, there's a hundredfold increase in the amount of energy. So this is way, 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 way bigger earthquake than the ones I just talked about. You would expect an earthquake of this size to have a relatively large number of fatalities. But if you look, this is 20 times fewer than people died in Haiti. So just to kind of recalibrate yourself, only 5,000 injuries. And what that actually suggests and is true, most of these deaths came from the tsunami and very few, a few hundred probably came from the actual shaking. Here's the intensity distribution. One thing you can see from this is that the earthquake was offshore, so the highest intensity of shaking was actually on the seafloor. This is bad for creating tsunamis, but it's, it actually keeps buildings from falling down on people relatively well. This is a plot of tsunami wave heights. The interesting thing about this tsunami wave height plot is this was calculated about six years before the earthquake. So as part of earthquake science, um, everybody knows that the Pacific Rim is very prone to tsunami exciting earthquakes. And it takes too long to simulate in this, with this level of detail a tsunami using a computer after the event happens because the waves travel faster than the computers can crunch the numbers. So what the Pacific Tsunami Warning System which is a cooperative research organization, has done is, is pre-simulate all the likely earthquakes and the resulting tsunamis. So within about four minutes of this earthquake happening, this map was available that predicted wave heights for the entire Pacific Basin. So it was only in the immediate region immediately adjacent to this earthquake did the tsunami wave arrive before the tsunami warning. For everywhere else in the Pacific, including most of the coast of Japan, the warnings went off before the wave arrived. So you have this huge amount of destruction because this is just an incredibly humongous earthquake. But the level of preparedness in Japan is even better than it is in California. In fact, the Japan Meteorological Agency I just scroll down here. <coughs> they issue a weather and an earthquake forecast every single day. Um, and students and children and toddlers and emergency response personnel and the government, they all know what to do if there's an earthquake or when, really, when there's an earthquake. And on top of that, the whole Pacific Basin, as I said, has thought well in advance about what to do during an earthquake. And in fact, tsunami water waves travel slow enough that as soon as an earthquake hits, the seismic, global seismic network 
detects the waves, the seismic waves, they can pull up their pre-simulated tsunami forecast and then issue a warning for the whole basin. So aside from the coast of Japan and in particular the areas of the Japanese coast where the tsunami wave hit the coast before the warning had been calculated, there were no fatalities from this event. So basically no fatalities from the shaking, especially considering its magnitude. And really, I mean, surprisingly few fatalities considering the size of the tsunami. And if we compare that with Sumatra, we see the counter example. So almost the same size earthquake, about 300,000 deaths, a humongous number of injuries now. But basically no fatalities, again, from the actual shaking with the earthquake. So you can see here is the same intensity scale I showed you. The high intensity is only on these little teeny weeny islands that very few people live on. So there were relatively few fatalities in this event from the shaking itself, but the tsunami really whacked it to everybody, right? So now here's what one of those islands looked like before and after. Here's a post-event simulated picture of the tsunami. And what you can see from this is, one, it lacks the level of detail. Two, this came out about six months after the earthquake. And three, you have waves propagating throughout the Indian Ocean Basin. And so although many Indonesians died in the Sumatran earthquake, more than half of the fatalities were in Sri Lanka, on the coast of India, on the east coast of Africa, in Somalia and Kenya, um, and elsewhere on, in, in Southeast Asia, on the Thai coast, um, in Laos and places like that. So in this case, there was and there still is not an Indian Ocean tsunami warning system equivalent to the Pacific tsunami warning system. So what I would say is that these case studies give a really fantastic test of our idea that in fact if we do provide information, critical information that is relevant to the well-being of people that they can understand and act upon that is true and that is timely, we can make their lives better off. We improve their welfare. And so to me, we developed this law and then we just tested it and it's absolutely right that sharing information in a very specific way furthers social justice. It makes people better off and in a simple way, it makes them not be dead, which clearly makes them better off. This is just one more little piece of this idea. So this is a plot. Um, corruption happens to scale linearly with GDP. So the poorer the country, the more corrupt it is, more or less. If you plot earthquake fatalities against whether or not a country is more corrupt or less corrupt, than you would expect it to be, given its GDP, you see that almost all earthquake fatalities occur in places that are frankly pretty shitty. So they have bad governance, people are illiterate, people don't know how to understand information, they have no access to information, the government doesn't have access to information, and there's no mechanism to prepare and respond. So this again sort of maybe less directly than the case studies that we worked through, reiterates the idea that working together as a community means sharing information, and especially sharing information about things that really, really matter to the well-being of the people in that community. And this is not only true for earthquakes. So let's do what I promised we would do, which is quickly revisit this and then take it to a more complicated set of cases. Does anybody want to modify our law? You're all pretty happy with it? Yeah? So this like capability to respond, you mean? Yeah. 
So if you're just too darn dumb to understand my warning, it's not my problem. Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> okay, so that's not what we're trying to say. That we need to provide information in a form that's understandable to whoever the audience may be. And there must be a way to do this. There has to be a way that we can make everything and anything understandable if it's important enough. But let's say a capability of responding, right? So it's not much good if I tell California there's going to be an earthquake tomorrow and they haven't done any of the preparedness, right? We have to be able to respond in some reasonable fashion. Is that what you mean? I like that. Yeah, Jim. But, uh, but ability to uh, respond is dependent upon the economic condition of the country uh, to begin with. Uh, and uh, in Haiti uh, and, uh, and some of these other areas, um, it, it would have been totally impossible, even though they have been provided with uh, all of the, uh, the warning information. I think this does hint at that. Like, there are certain structural barriers to getting information across that may in fact make it impossible but I would still argue that even in those circumstances one has an ethical obligation to provide the warning and if you have to provide it to the people on the ground so that from the grassroots they can actually take action and say our government is not protecting us from this great risk and we're going to do something about it and I think that you know, structural barriers towards conveying the information aren't necessarily a get out of jail free card in this case. Yeah? I think you have to go back to the reasonableness. If you're, if you're the government of Haiti and you have $100 million, you have to make a decision should I provide clean water for the people or should I give them information about an earthquake or try and make the building more? Uh, earthquake, um, I think that's a really great point and I think that a key piece of this is sort of that non-coercive element that one should provide the information and then the government or preferably the people can decide do I want to spend this money on water or do I want to spend it on earthquake resistant buildings but in order to make that good decision in order to function as a just society, which is what that decision-making process actually means to me, you have to have the information in the first place. And you have to allow people to say, you know what, I'm not going to fix my house because I need food tonight. And I think that is the, that kind of encapsulates the idea of justice. Let me move on to some of these more complicated problems because they might illuminate some of these issues more clearly. So in economics, this is called asymmetric information. When one person in a transaction knows more than the other person in the transaction. And typically, we imagine sort of economic transactions do good for both parties, right? I have too much of something. I don't even want it. You have something I want. You want what I have too much of. We trade, we exchange, and we're both better off than we were. But in the case of strongly asymmetric information, that transaction is not necessarily just. And so um, all of these derivatives where mortgages were combined and then broken out into more and less, less risky tranches, but then sold without a very clear set of parameters on what was included in each of these derivatives or mortgage-backed securities. That was a bad transaction. That was an unjust transaction according to our scheme. It led to a bad outcome for at least some of the parties in the transaction in part because their information was asymmetrical. But certainly the people who are selling these things knew that they weren't worth anything. So there's all sorts of, you know, emails that of people joking around about what a load of rubbish they were selling to these other people. And so this essentially is the economic equivalent of a magnitude 9 earthquake. You have asymmetric information, it leads to a breakdown of the system where great harm is conferred upon some sub of the people who are supposed to be sharing judiciously with one another. 
Ecosystem services is another case where this is clearly true. And I'm not going to talk too much about this because I know Jim Birchfield is going to talk about this in, in great detail in the context of social justice. But supposing that this community relies on the grazing ground for camels. So this is a picture from Somalia. But overgrazing camels and precipitation, le or l low precipitation, leads to famine. And so by not telling people how land use actually affects their future well-being, we set them up in this position of asymmetric information that reduces the, the sustainability and efficacy of their society. Maybe a simple case is, is with water. So this is a picture from Ethiopia. And you can see how many people are relying on this one tiny source of water for their health and well-being. If they don't understand how the hydrologic cycle works, where this water is coming from, and how it cycles through the environment, and therefore how it can be contaminated either by human waste or by agricultural chemicals, then they can't, they simply can't make good decisions. They can't improve the social well-being of their community. And to me, that constitutes an unjust situation. And again, because the information transfer is not clear and straightforward, and consider burning of the Amazon. So the people who are doing this are making individual decisions about their livelihood that would potentially be different if they knew that rainforest soils are exhausted in three to five years after they're burned, or that it would rain much less when there aren't any trees left in the landscape. Or maybe they would decide to burn because that's the only choice available to them. But to me, a just society is one in which the individual actors in this situation are weighing all of the sides of their decision because they have good information about the consequences and the context of their choices. And the ultimate doozy, climate change. So this is relevant to the kind of point where I asked you, what if the effect will be borne by the children or the children's children of these people, do you still have an obligation to warn? And everybody, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people said, yeah. And in this case, the breakdown in that pipeline of information, I frankly don't understand very well, but it surely exists. So the scientific data that tells us about climate change is pretty indisputable at this point. So this is a figure that comes from the International Panel on Climate Change. It's a compilation. You can see for each continent, the, there's the number of physical observations of warming and the number of biological. So in some places, you have like 30,000 individual studies that are suggesting warming. You have hundreds and hundreds of physics studies that are suggesting warming. And these, this is the temperature change 1970 to 2004. This is uh, as much as three and a half degrees Celsius, but in a lot of places it's sort of one to two degrees. So there's really no question that the information exists that the Earth is getting warmer on average, and that that is in fact true, and that it matters, and maybe it's not understandable, or maybe the problem is we don't know what to do about it. But I would argue that the, it, somewhere along this pipeline, this kind of information, this kind of certainty about what's happening is, is getting dissipated somewhere. If you look at modeling um, simulations, but of past time, not projecting forward, this blue line shows the simulation not including the effect of human contributions to the atmosphere. The pink line does include the effect of human contributions to the atmosphere, and the black line is the actual temperature. So the question of, is it our fault, to me is also indisput indisputably, yes, it is our fault. But it sort of doesn't matter what our fault, whether it's our fault or not. What really matters is this. So this is impenetrably dense, right? In the back, you can't see it. This is a summary of all the bad things that are going to happen because the Earth gets warm. And they're scaled where this is more warming, 5 degrees C, which is probably what we're looking at. 
given our current rate of CO2 equivalent emissions, this is no change from the long time <coughs> temperature average. Some of these are really bad. A lot, 30% of global coastal wetlands gone. Productivity of all cereals decreases. That's rice, wheat, you know, not, it's not apple jacks. Oh. <laughs> uh, it's things that we all really, really need to eat. So I think in the case of climate change, the information exists, but we ought to think to ourselves, if we believe this in the abstract, that sharing good information in an understandable way actually makes the world a better place, at least for human beings, then we ought to find a way to get this message across to each and every person. So what I like to do at the end of really kind of depressing talks like this is pivot around to what can we actually do? How can we as individuals help? What actions should be taken to ensure that Information is shared amongst the members of a society, and, it, and frankly, we live in a global society, so how can we share information with our fellow humans worldwide? And there's some easy things to do. The first is do what you're doing. Try to learn about the world around you. Try to be literate and numerate and curious, and try to use good information to make decisions. Don't just flip a coin unless it doesn't really matter too much. Try to be a thoughtful human being. And that's harder than it sounds, but I think it's super important. But the other thing to do is support outreach and education efforts, either using your own skills as a teacher and a sharer of information and your own social network to point people to information that they would like and appreciate and be curious about, or by more formal ways of supporting outreach efforts. So here's an example from my own research group. We developed a series of little posters that explain why earthquakes happen and where and what you can do when there's an earthquake. There's now 275,000 of them throughout Central America, the Caribbean, Central Asia, Pakistan, and Southeast Asia. So it's a little thing, but it's kind of useful, I think, and it happens to be sort of lending my own expertise to something where information is, is worthwhile. I can't knock on every door in Lahore. I don't think I should have to, but I can do a little bit to kind of push information one step further down that pipeline to the people who need it. And I just heard on the BBC yesterday a really cool project run by a guy named Jerome Lewis at University College London. He's actually given these Baka pygmies in Congo each a handheld GPS. They've been reprogrammed because these guys are not literate, so all of the menus are just a little picture of something. And these pygmies are going around through the forest in the Congo, marking on their GPS where illegal logging and poaching is happening. So there are little efforts worldwide, just like this one, that try to engage local people by teaching them to understand information and use that information to make good decisions. And I think all I can say is, if you believe the law that we created for ourselves, and I really, really, really do, then this is the kind of thing that you should be all in favor of and, and doing, in your, whether in your own community or when you travel um, anywhere around the world. So I will leave it at that and open it up to questions. Thanks, Rebecca. As usual, I think that Jay and Susan will each have a microphone, uh, and I'll, we'll all try to locate people who have questions. For the sake of uh, equity, let's limit our <laughs> questions to one question and uh, follow up. Right, we better be fair, huh? Oh, there <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, so uh, questions. It seems to me that the real problem is dealing with the either poverty-stricken governments and or corrupt governments who, you know, once the local people point out where the illegal logging is going on, will they stop it? Well, that's where I want Occupy Guy to come up and help me. I mean, there is this, I think, great hope that 
If enough people at the grassroots care about something, then you can change anything. And maybe that's Pollyanna-ish of me, and, and it certainly doesn't happen fast, but where else do you start? And I think there's some reason to believe that that is, in fact, true. If we sort of buy into my definition of a society, that it's a collection of people who actually voluntarily join a society, that if that society doesn't serve their well-being and they know it, and that and they know it part is really important, then they can opt out. They can start over. And I don't know how you go about doing that, but and I'm sure it's really, really, really not easy. But I think there you don't even have the chance of grassroots change if people have no idea that they're being ill used. I don't know your name, I'm sorry. I, can I call you Occupy Guy? <laughs> yeah, uh oh, the economist is going to correct me. I, I wonder what you think about um, the role of intellectual property in this process. Um, because, because I think uh, Dane, I think, talked about it a little bit last week, but it's the it's the idea that intellectual that the ability to to own intellectual property, on the one hand, incentivizes the development of of information, but on the other hand, restricts its its availability. I think that's a really fantastic question, and to be honest with you, I hadn't thought about it because there's absolutely no monetization of geology, <laughs> except for mining. Um, I think you're right. Like that, that does put a little bit of a spanner into here because you're really, I'm really talking about f the free sharing of information. And if information is in fact property, then that's asking a lot um, to have someone share what they created freely. I don't know. Gosh. I guess the, the, the question is, is, is intellectual property Unjust. Hmm. <laughs> Thanks for groaning for me. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess I would say no, but but let's say that we're restricting intellectual property actually impinges upon the well-being, the really fundamental well-being of many, many people then either it should be shared freely or there should be a market mechanism to compensate the creator of that information f in proportion to the good that they do, right? So, so maybe, you know, maybe my discovery of this medicine that by sharing its formula will save lots and lots of people, I, I should certainly get rewarded for that, but maybe its existence is a piece of information that people knowing about would create mechanisms to pay for it. And I'm kind of just grabbing here for ideas because I hadn't, hadn't honestly thought about that, but I think it's a really important caveat to this sort of idea. But I guess this doesn't really mandate that you share the information freely. It only mandate that you share it. So, yeah. But you know, to be honest with you, if someone came up to me and, and I thought they were credible, which I don't know how you get at that exactly, but if they said, look, I have information that is going to save your life, give me 10 bucks, I would probably give them 10 bucks, right? And if I were too poor to give them 10 bucks, I would expect somebody acting on my behalf to give them the 10 bucks. Maybe my government, maybe my community would pitch in all together to find out this important thing, right? If it's completely priced to the point where, you know, it's information that no one has the capability to act upon because they can't buy it, well, it doesn't exist then, right? 
I think the charlatans of the world would uh, perk up their ears when they heard that. <laughs> well, I, like I said, I would like it to be credible, right? And, and then that, there's a lot of devil in all of this, right? And, and so I'm, I'm sure we can come up with any number of scenarios where this all falls apart and people completely take advantage of each other. But let's go back to the original premise. That would simply be unjust, right? I'm not saying it's never going to happen or that it's not awesome for the guy who just got my 10 bucks, but it's not fair. So therein lies the central problem of the whole um, system. So you've, you've nailed it. People want to sell what they have, so. Anyway, you already answered my questions. <laughs> that was a good answer. So two, two points. So now in some places we have a lot of information and then we get uh, warning fatigue where you find people in Systems are in place and people ignore tsunami warnings and they ignore t tornado warnings because they're saturated with information. Uh, so what's the answer to that? Well, again, we're being really ideal here. We're saying it's true. So if, you're, if, it's, if the information is true, then you don't really have that problem so much. Well, it seems that people find true information to be inconvenient that they would rather pursue an immediate barbecue versus seeking safety. Well, I think that's great. I mean, again, this brings me back to the very beginning where I said, like, a functional, sustainable society, in my mind anyway, not based on any sociology, philosophy, or any kind of actual scholarship, is one that's non-coercive, right? So if you give people the warning and they're like, yo, I just want to go to the barbecue, Fine. They made that choice with full information. But if they die at a barbecue because they didn't know something bad was going to happen, that to me is less just than giving someone that choice to say, I want to go to the barbecue, or I'm going to feed my family this week. I'm not going to put more rebar in the floor of my house. That's just, it's not a perfect world, but at least people have the information they need to make that decision. I appreciate the discussion. This is very interesting. I liked you, the way you presented it. Um, I just question whether we actually have created the dynamics that we need to here, because the capacity to respond to the information, like, is, let me take a step back. I'm not sure information is, is all that's required, first of all, for any of these scenarios. Capacity respond is critical, and even more than that is the will. And within the will to respond, many of us in most societies go back to governance. And in governance, you have capacity and will. Some places have poor capacity, high will, high will, high capacity, and so forth. And uh, it's not enough for in, in any of those scenarios unless you have high will and high capacity to be able to respond to information that's received. So I just wondered what your, what your thought is on that and anybody else's. I think that's perfectly valid, but I guess I would just want to point out that the title of this talk is Information Equality is a Prerequisite. It doesn't say information equality is necessary and sufficient for social justice, but I still think you can't build the will or the capacity to respond if you don't know that an issue exists in the first place. So I still believe that the kind of first step in a process of building a more just society is to share information. And then people can develop the will or not, or develop the capacity or not. But this has to come first, because none of the other steps in that structural response make any sense if you don't know what you're dealing with. This is a, a, a bit of a follow-up question to the one that was just asked. Uh, information equality, of course, is essential. Um, and, and, but um, uh, going back to the ability to respond, um, the, uh, in, uh, the information that's given out, 
Um, there may be uh, uh, two differing opinions as to whether that's true or not. Uh, global warming, of course, is a prime example. And there seems to be a, a tremendous inequality uh, as far as the ability of uh, those uh, uh, naysayers. Um, they have the distinct advantage. Um, uh, what can we do about that? I mean, in the context of this talk, I would simply say that that's unjust, that people who are not sharing information or are sharing information which is not true are both unjust actors in a society and, and they make the society work less well. Whereas people who share information that is true and share it in a way that's understandable and usable are making the society work better. And, and that's really all I'm, I'm trying to say um, with this premise. And I think, you know, the climate debate is, is a tricky one, partly because of what you're suggesting, but also because it's probabilistic, right? So we have this difficulty with true in the sense that we know within certain confidence intervals that certain things are going to happen. But that's a sort of more sophisticated level of understanding than just this is going to happen at this time in this place. And, and that's why one of the thought experiments or one of the refinements of the thought experiment I asked you guys to think about is, what if I only know the probability of those people dying, not that they will or won't, right? And, and most people said that I still had an ethical obligation to convey that information. And th that's also a challenge in the understandable, right? So people who are not numerate and not n literate, it's not that easy to teach them probability theory. But it's, it can be done, right? There's got to be a way to convey that understanding. And if people do understand probability, that makes it easier for them to say, well, it's only a 50-50 chance that the barbecue is going to get hit by a tornado. So I'm definitely going to go because there's really hot chick there, right? <laughs> Whereas if it's 100% or zero, he's just a moron if he goes and he is, right? So there's all sorts of refinements of this that happen when you look at real examples. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. This has been um, what, what a great approach to these problems. So I want to kind of test what kind of pragmatism your theory of social justice represents. And I think about my thought experiment is if you had a choice between retrofitting current buildings and giving everyone an iPhone or a earthquake or tsunami pager so that they could have the information, if you could be a paternalist and just do it because you know it's better for them, or you could respect them as equals and just provide them information, um, which would you do? And is your decision on that, that giving them the information it is superior because it works, it ought to work better over the long term given everything we know about the world, or is it based on some moral conception that they are equals and deserve that even if just retrofit retrofitting their houses would in the near term work better? So in the context of this talk, I was really careful when I laid out what I thought social justice meant. and I my example of a computer telling you what was the best thing for you each morning was sort of meant to look at this, which is I, I would find that coercive. So if I just like spent all my money on retrofitting everybody's house for them, but didn't tell them why or what was going on, I guess my personal feeling is that that's less just than giving them the information and letting them make the decision. But that's like, I just picked that. I mean, if you really wanted to do it right and for cheapest, and well, it's cheaper probably to give everyone an iPhone than to retrofit every house. But let's just say that uh, if you really wanted to make sure that the most people were protected, you would just do it. You would immunize everyone by force, and you would retrofit houses in seismic areas by force, and you would make everybody stop emitting carbon by force. But I, I think that 
fundamentally that's in some way not just. So I guess I would pick the iPhones and then just hope that they could figure out what that information meant. I was curious if you could, uh, if you've had any ideas about Missoula scale local information inequalities that could actually be addressed. Well, I know that the floor joists in the geology building are not tied to the wall members, and that makes me a little worried. <laughs> but that's sort of a glib um, answer. I mean, I think in our society where most people do have access to education, are literate, are at least partially numerate, and you know have a lot of capabilities to make their own choices and act upon them. That you know, my role in this is doing this and saying, you guys use your noggin, right? And and the rest of it is up to you. Is up to you to take action where you think action is warranted. And for each person in this room, that's different. And I think it operates really well at the community scale, like a city the size of Missoula. There's a lot of unique things here that have com come about as a result of community action. Not least giving my husband a really great job. <laughs> I'm wondering, given um, the variability of resources that we've talked about, whether it was corruption or uh, resources to make change, whether just from a pragmatic standpoint you shouldn't change that uh, sentence to information quality is a prerequisite <laughs> for social justice. And I go back to the picture you had where you were helping people in Latin America or South America develop um, posters that could help people understand and make decisions that way. Now, it isn't the same as having the kind of information warning system they have in California, but at least, relatively speaking, it can make a big difference and provide more justice for those people. Yeah, and that's my, I mean, that's sort of my ending note, which is we each do what we can to make the world a better place by sharing information and trying to share the best information we can and helping one another to understand it in a way that's useful. And I, I think that's essentially all we can ask, but that's an awful lot. And it, 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 I hope that it makes a difference. One more question. Oh, that was such a good ending note. <laughs> Thank you.